Well, good afternoon and welcome to our 16th webinar. We are going into week. Did you lose audio? Just heard that we were 16. We're the sweet 16. So this is a part of a bigger initiative and we're just really grateful to um, have Daniel and uh, Wes Childers, both of where Stewart here with us today. They are going to be delivering our presentation on e-commerce, essential for small business. They will talk about uh, the different options, affordable options on how to be prepared for a longer recovery and share the ability to adapt static websites to online shopping. Daniel and Wes are uh, both with We Are Steward, of course. I'm gonna let them say a little bit more about themselves and their company, but thank you guys so much for joining us today and for bringing our presentation. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, we really appreciate uh, being on. So uh, a unique, unique time to, to talk about this kind of stuff in business because everything is different and it's changing every single day. Uh, and I think it's a, a really appropriate uh, topic for the time. So we're, we're excited to talk about it. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over and Daniel and Wes, again, anything that you'd like to say about We're Stuart and yourself, and then we'll get uh, moving forward with today's presentation. We will, of course, send the presentation out after um, the final review tomorrow to all those on the call. It will also go out membership wide and be hosted on our website, along with all of the other webinars uh, from prior events. Um, if you have questions, you can use your question button on the GoToWebinar app. They will filter through to us and we will have a chance to, to ask those questions and have answers at the uh, following the presentation. So thanks again, guys, and Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, we appreciate doing this kind of thing. And uh, I think that we can offer a little bit of advice that'll uh, help some of you guys out that are thinking about adding this as either a value add to your business or uh, if you have an idea for an e-commerce business that that runs everything off of a website, I think that we've got some good kind of starting points here. I'm Daniel Stewart. I'm the president of Ware Stewart, uh, downtown Broad Street. I've uh, been doing this for uh, about 13 years. Um, we work with clients, large and small, uh, in all different categories. We like to say from dive bars to universities uh, and kind of everything in between. Uh, we like it that way because it certainly never gets boring um, and we get to learn a lot from different industries. So what we learn from the credit union, we could potentially use a principle or piece of that when we are working with uh, the cybersecurity company or, or something like that. So uh, we're big on culture, we're big on team uh, and uh, we're, 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 we're kind of all about solving problems uh, for our clients. So Wes. Yeah, I'm um, Wes Childers. I'm the director of interactive and digital media. So anything that falls kind of in the web world or content, video, photography, that sort of thing. Um, my team works on those projects. I've been working kind of on the internet and adjacent to the web for a little over 20 years now. I'm doing everything from helping small businesses, nonprofits, uh, larger e-commerce manufacturing companies, um, uh, all those kinds of things in their web projects. Uh, and so um, we're excited to, to share just some maybe high level tips. We can get into maybe some specific questions at the end, but um, wanted to walk you guys through uh, just some high level things we think you ought to be considering today. Sure. Want to walk through this, Daniel? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is, you know, again, kind of touching on the types of folks that we work with. And if you want to just kind of go ahead and get to the uh, problem solving portion, I'll kind of kick it off. So we're going to talk about solving problems. Uh, that is not only what we do, but that's probably what everybody on uh, this this uh, this webinar also do. Uh, we want to talk about why you might need to add e-commerce, uh, the things to consider, and uh, stuff that is a little bit outside of the norm, 
that you should probably be thinking about um, as you add this service into whatever it is that you do. Uh, and then a couple of tips, right? Again, at the end of the day, we all solve problems. Um, it's, it, there's kind of three main things that we think about it at, at Ware Stewart. We gotta offer a solution, right? Uh, we gotta make it easy. Uh, that's a principle that I think anybody can, can bring into their business is figuring out ways to make it easy to buy whatever it is that you sell. Um, that should be one of the first things you consider when changing or adding or optimizing whatever service or whatever it is that you do. Certainly these days, everyone wants it to be as easy as possible. E-commerce is a perfect fit for making things easy, taking the steps away from getting hired, someone paying for your services or buying your products, that's huge. And then the other part is keeping up. Um, if you're not thinking about solving a problem and, and you're not trying to make it easy, uh, it's, it's likely that someone else is. Um, so always uh, having that underdog attitude of keeping up with trends and what consumers want is huge. Uh, habits, of consumers are always changing even before this crazy COVID-19 situation and they are definitely going to be different afterwards. Uh, so you really need to take a hard look at how you sell your services and really what you sell and ask yourself if it is the perfect solution for a post-coronavirus uh, world. So those are kind of our, our top three things there. So I wanna start by just addressing why you might wanna consider uh, an e-commerce site. So especially in, in the last eight weeks, a lot of us have had to face the fact that our customers can't come to us. Um, businesses have had been, have been closed, We've, there's been stay at home orders. And so um, if customers can't come to us physically, we need to be able to meet them where they're at. And so um, number one, I, I think just being accessible to customers and, and being where they are um, people are spending a lot of their lives online as it is. People are, um, you know, so many people already shop online and we're seeing that behavior change drastically, even just looking at the stats of the last uh, couple of weeks. People who may have not been comfortable before um, are, are changing their behavior and their habits. So the other thing is, you know, you have the opportunity to be open 24 seven. You know, there are very few small businesses who have the opportunity and aren't constrained by time, whether that's the t time of, you know, the traditional kind of work day, or you know needing to be able to take a weekend or a break or a day off but the, the internet is open and can and can be your storefront or your ability to sell or connect with your customers that may seem very obvious and, and very simple um, but it is one of the huge benefits uh, of having an e-commerce um, website and some way to, to serve your customers in that way yeah um, we say that about websites in, in general wes it's like having a having a really good sales guy or gal that doesn't sleep you know, and so you pay them, they're not even on salary. You pay them once and then you're, you're good to go. And, you know, and I think it can't be dismissed the fact that you don't know when your customers are, are available. I mean, everybody's schedules have shifted so much. You know, my wife and I, we're doing our grocery shopping at, you know, 8.30 at night and then finishing it up at seven o'clock the next morning so we can put in our order for that afternoon. So um, just, just having that flexibility um, is an awesome opportunity. Um, the other thing is that just consumer needs and priorities have changed. Like I just mentioned, you know, I uh, oftentimes can't take the time to get away and get to the grocery store and spend an hour walking around now, but we can use the time that we've got to maybe place that order. We can shop on demand. Um, we can plan ahead and, and giving your customers those options uh, is critical because priorities have changed and we're in a different world and not everything is going to go back um, to the way it was before. And I think that's an, an opportunity um, because people are seeing the benefits of, of e-commerce and online um, shopping more than ever. Um, some, uh, the other thing here is that kind of current circumstances, one of the things we've seen, especially with small businesses, is that, is that customers of small business and people who have um, businesses that they love, whether that's restaurants or small or retail or you know friends and family members who run business, they've got um, people who want to support them. And if you don't have a way uh, for somebody to be able to support you online, especially in this time, um, you're missing an opportunity. I mean, there's just um, people can't, if they can't shop with you, then um, you're leaving an opportunity on the table because people do want 
uh, small businesses to survive this time. Um, I think being local um, may give you an opportunity to provide something that consumer needs that aren't being met by maybe bigger retailers. You know, Amazon, at least early on in this, um, cut back and we're only doing essential kind of supplies or prioritizing things that were considered essential. And so being a local business or a local small business, you may have the opportunity to meet a need uh, in a way that uh, consumers or your customers can't get met in another bigger way through a big box store or some, something more traditional like that to think about. Um, and then we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but like consumer behavior has changed. I think a lot of people who have never you know, uh, ordered their groceries online or never placed an order for, you know, household goods online who have had to do that in the last few weeks are probably going to continue to do that. And, and so there's an opportunity here uh, to take advantages of kind of changes in customer behavior and to kind of be on the forefront of that um, and to offer, um, offer that to your customers. So some things you might want to consider, you know, you're sold on the idea of e-commerce and things you might want to consider before setting up your website. Um, I'm going to go over kind of three high level things that uh, you probably want to think through. One of those is the e-commerce platform. How are you going to run a store? What does that website um, platform look like? Uh, payment processing. If you're selling something, you got to be able to take a payment of some kind. So I'm going to talk through some of the options there. And then shipping and fulfillment. How are you actually going to um, provide the goods or services that you've sold uh, to your customers? So in the how to choose a platform kind of category, the first thing I would ask is, do I already have a website? And what is that website built on top of? Is it something that's been around for 10 years? Is it using an existing platform that may already offer an e-commerce add-on pretty easily? Um, does it have a content management system in the back end? How easy is it to make updates or changes? Um, you know, the last thing you want to do is, is sign yourself up for something that you can't maintain and can't provide a good level of customer service. And so thinking about you know, how are you going to change your processes and make it so that you can um, easily update your site, add products, update as, you know, as you see trends and things shift. Um, do you have an existing POS system? Um, you know, very well may make a lot of sense to build on top of what you're already using as far as software goes. And so that's another thing that I would ask, you know, especially if you're a restaurant or if you are um, using one of the kind of um, more retail oriented uh, POS systems that have kind of risen in the last couple of years, maybe it's with Square or with Shopify or one of the um, kind of retail focused things like that. And then I would ask, you know, on top of all that, should you start over or should you add, try to add to your existing site? And we'll go over some options here in a minute um, about what you might want to consider there. Um, first off, I would say most people, especially in a small business situation, might want to look at a software as a service solution. Um, these are um, platforms that are built to be kind of all in one. Uh, they're ready to go with maybe minimal setup. They're kind of, a, most of them are available to be as a DIY kind of effort. You know, they of course could be added on by, by an agency or a freelancer or someone who could help you uh, get set up, but they are made to be kind of out of the box solutions that could get you up and moving pretty quickly. Uh, the benefits is that there are no software to update or maintain. Um, they kind of are self-contained. Now, due to that, they are somewhat limited sometimes. They can't be customized a lot. Um, you're limited maybe by what add-ons that software as a service offers. And then sometimes there's additional fees depending on how your how big your site or store grows. Right? Fees could be added on by how many sales you have or how many products you have in your store, or how much traffic you're getting. So you're going to want to look at those things. Um, and so generally, they could cost more than the self-hosted options that we're going to look at here in a minute. But um, they definitely are a good place to start looking for most small businesses. Yeah, um, and I would, I would jump in and add to that. We've seen, you know, a SaaS option be uh, a, a good avenue for uh, a lot of either small business owners or hobbyists that are starting something on the side where you don't really know how popular your goods or services are going to be. It's almost like the Etsy model, um, where if there's something that you do at night, let's say you sell quilts uh, and you wanna put them out there to see how popular they are. Um, it's certainly lower cost of entry to use a platform like this instead of building something com custom with a web development company to experiment and to see what your customers even want in the first place. 
but isn't always the best long-term solution if you're getting lots of traffic and you have, uh, you know, lucky for you, you're super popular uh, and you're, you're selling a lot and you need to add a little bit more complexity, but it is a really great, great place to start to dip your toe in the water. Yeah, and just one thing, another additional word of caution there is that some of these could be hard to migrate from one platform to another. So they, they do kind of lock you in as a part of their business model to, you know, they don't make it easy to transition out always. And so you really just want to, as much as you can, plan ahead a little bit as if you know where you kind of want to go. Um, some of these you may want to be a little bit careful with. Um, these are some of the names you may have seen around. A lot of these guys are pretty big um, in as far as advertising and trying to get in front of consumers and enable the end user. And so Shopify, Squarespace is one that's not really e-commerce only focused. They really are a content management system, but they have an e-commerce um, capability that's kind of built on top of their uh, website platform. Big Commerce is another one um, there that you might have seen. Of course, in any of these that we're going to talk about today, there are a dozen more in all of these categories that you could look at. I tried to highlight some of the ones that are established and have been around longer and are maybe um, used a little bit more because what what we see a lot is that the more um, customer base these companies have the broader the options are that they have to kind of build and flex and, and grow um, what you're able to offer there um, kind of the other end of the spectrum is a self-hosted option now these options are um, you are going to have to have your own server um, you're going to have to have a little bit of technical knowledge in your setup. It might take a little bit longer to, to set up on the front end. You may need a developer or a freelancer. Um, but the benefits they give you is they really let you own the platform that you're building your website on. They give you a level of customizability that you don't necessarily get with software as a surface options. Um, you can do some more custom things as far as the visually how your store might look or behave. Um, and the other benefit of a lot of these because they're open source or free, as far as the software part goes, um, there's usually plugins or add-ons or themes or features that, and kind of a development community that already exists around these platforms to where you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. You can take advantage of something that has been built by somebody else and get a much lower cost to maybe add some custom functionality or even free in some cases. Um, yeah, Wes, talk a little bit about uh, what you mean by your own server. Yeah, so, um, by own server, it don't mean that you necessarily have to own the physical machine, but you are going to have to have a computer that hosts your website. That can be in the cloud. It can be, you know, we we even at the agency partner with a hosting company that um, that specializes in hosting. But you are going to need to have a a a machine, uh, you know, in a server facility somewhere that hosts your website, and so it runs the software that hosts the website and hosts the e-commerce store. All of these options that are self-hosted, these uh, platforms, um, WooCommerce, which has been recently purchased by WordPress in the last couple of years, and so it's built on top of their content management system. Magento has an open source option. Uh, PrestaShop, OpenCart. These are all um, software that needs to run on a computer that is the, the interface and kind of the, the management system that kind of powers and drives your store. Um, some of the downsides of these is that there's sometimes very little or no centralized support. They are a lot, oftentimes based off of open source projects. So there's a big community around uh, supporting, but there is not always a number you can call if you have trouble. You might need a little bit more development uh, help or some some outside help. But they are they are good options for a lot of small businesses who have uh, specialized needs. We have a lot of customers um, with the agency who are going to use one of these kinds of options because we can give them something that fits their um, business processes and the, and the ways that they need to operate. Um, and then add-on options is just a third thing that I did want to address. You may have a more static website or something simple that is basically a, a brochure for your company that has got business hours and talks about what you do and what you offer. And for some, um, for some businesses, um, you may only need to offer you know, three or four products, or maybe you're an HVAC company and you just wanna be able to offer a flat rate uh, you know, service visit, and that's the only thing that you need to offer, but you wanna make that, you wanna remove that level of friction um, from the customer experience. Uh, these options would allow you to put a, a button, an add to cart button on your site 
they would kind of add a little bit of e-commerce functionality on top of an existing static site that could be built with basically any platform. They're kind of platform agnostic, um, but they are scripts that could be added to a website that would uh, give cart or add to cart or pay functionality. So Foxy.io, Snipcart, PayPal. PayPal is probably the simplest and you may have even okay. seen one or another. Uh, you know, just a little snippet of button code that says add to cart and allow somebody to, to pay or process. Then beyond just the traditional e-commerce platforms, I would um, encourage you to not forget other channels and, par and marketplaces. And what I mean by this is, um, you know, many of the sellers that you see on Amazon or Walmart.com are not actually those businesses stocking and carrying products. They are actually small businesses or retailers or people who have side businesses who are selling um, or reselling goods on their platforms. And this can be made a little bit easier by depending on the e-commerce platform that you choose. This can be a little easier or more difficult depending. Um, but some of the things like Shopify or WooCommerce, they've got the ability to kind of load your products into one centralized location and then push them out to these uh, multiple marketplaces. I would also think about, depending on what you're selling, you may want to consider things that um, like eBay or Etsy. Etsy is more traditionally around handmade goods or one-of-a-kind products, but these are also places where people are already shopping. And so you want to be, again, where your customers already are. If you can meet them where they are, um, you want to you wanna do that. And then I would also consider like category specific marketplaces. And what I mean by that is um, I, I collect um, vinyl and there's a website I use to kind of um, manage a collection and kind of want list of records I want to buy. And that, that website also has a marketplace on there. So independent record stores or individuals can sell specifically that on their marketplace. And so when, when uh, all the coronavirus stuff spun up a couple of months ago and everybody had to shut down, Lots of record stores put their inventory on this website because it gave them a, a mark a plate a place to market their goods where customers already were. Another example is I saw a local bookstore, um, the Book Tavern, uh, promote that they had a, a deal with Bookshop.org, and Bookshop.org is providing an alternative to people who want to support independent bookstores rather than ordering books off of Amazon. But they give you that experience of a, a large e-commerce marketplace that then can be fulfilled by your local uh, bookstore. And so that's just another example of a marketplace. Whatever industry you're in, there's probably some place where people are already gathering uh, that specialize in those goods. So I'd look at and see if there's a way to, to take advantage yeah. of those. And something I would something I would touch on here, Wes, because, you know, as you know, a lot of our clients have their own e-commerce site and they also partner with things like Amazon to also host their, their products there. Um, and those companies might be might be big, and that makes sense for them. But also for small businesses, you know, you might look at the uh, the task of adding e-commerce to to your business and think that I don't think I'm going to get a lot of sales. I don't know if it's worth it. Um, it's not necessarily about you know I had five people buy off of my site uh, this month, and so that counts as as five sales. Uh, you really got to consider how that can magnify uh, one new customer uh, on e-commerce that is a either returning customer or could potentially be an advocate for your business or tell their friends and family how easy it was to buy whatever it is that you sell. That that five uh, might be worth 25, and uh, it's it can be somewhat of a longer road to have uh, that amplification happen. Uh, but when considering uh, either, you know, having the expense or making the investment to do that, uh, it's it's important to stay optimistic, even about low sales at the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I want to touch just briefly on restaurant specific platforms. I, I'll just walk through. There's a ton of these. Everybody is jockeying to be like the name, you know, the name that everybody recognizes. I'm sure you've seen a lot of these. I would just say if you're a restaurant, again, you want to consider is can this already tie into your POS system that you've got? Is this, um, you know, depending on the area you're in, do these um, websites already service or are they, do they already have kind of market domination or saturation um, in the area that you're in? 
you know, Augusta to go is a locally based one um, that I think a lot of people around here use, but there's also all these other ones that are kind of springing up and you know, spending a lot of money to try to be the dominant player. So um, do your research here. I don't have a strong recommendation one of the, you know, one way or the other right now, just because there's so much up in the air, but this is definitely a huge growing area that we've absolutely seen probably just like, yeah, you know, turnover, you know, 10 times, you know, more business than they probably had, you know, three months ago. So, so interesting story that happened this week. We have a restaurant client client who has just a, a basic HTML website and never offered online ordering before. And of course needs to do it now. And uh, rather than hire developers or designers to kind of build that, it actually made more sense and it was a you know a great recommendation even though it just kind of took the customer completely out of our out of our agency uh, is to switch POS systems to something that already had that built in I believe it was toast um, yeah. was the platform was the plat the POS platform so the, the 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 pain of switching over your POS system and doing all that input and if you've done this before you know it, it, it it's it can be a task to do that but that actually made more sense than keeping the POS that they had and then having a separate e-commerce ordering uh, platform that they were going to have to pay somebody uh, to kind of build and, and help them implement. Okay. So second thing in that process of kind of things to consider, and this one is not going to be as broad as like the platform consideration, but you do want to consider payment processing. There's a lot of, um, a lot of factors that can de determine how much of the money that comes through your e-commerce site that you actually get to keep because all of these payment processors, I'm sure if you're a small business and you take credit cards physically, you already know this, but like through the e-commerce platform, there's just even more ways for them to keep small chunk, you know, of all of your um, sales. And so you want to look at the pros and cons for each. There are pros and cons for each of these. You know, you've probably seen some of these names, PayPal, you know, PayPal, started being just a way to process payments uh, early days of the internet 15 or 20 years ago you know they will process all kinds of credit card um you know each of the major credit cards but they also have their own kind of credit offering and they'll do e-checks and that kind of thing stripe is another one that we like just for their ease of use and kind of they, they're kind of transparent and get out of the way they also are very uh forward thinking in the technology realm and so they if you use stripe you don't necessarily ever see that name on your website, but they um, allow you to easily do things like Apple Pay or Google Pay or some of the things that are, can remove some of the friction uh, for your customers and processing on your website. Square is another big one that started out as just being an easy way to kind of take a credit card with your phone, but you're now seeing their POS offerings. They also have an e-commerce platform where you can set up a store. So depending on kind of the environment that you have built your business around, you know, you can you can Kind of keep everything in one kind of family in one um, and sometimes that can make things a little bit simpler for you some of these um, payment processors hold funds longer than others and so you may have considerations as far as cash flow some take a different percentage rate most of them are pretty close but when you know the higher you know the more sales you're doing the more the small uh, percentages can can add up and make a difference um, and I think you just want to consider user friction as well. How can you make it easy for your customers to check out? I would pay attention and listen to what um, what your customers are asking for. You know, you're seeing things like being able to pay with Venmo or Cash App or Apple Pay or things like that that, that don't even require a credit card. You know, so much of e-commerce shopping these days, if we look at analytics, you know, happens on a phone or a tablet or a device where somebody might start in one place on a computer and then finish, you know, on their sofa in the evening, you know, checking out or things like that. And so anything you can do to kind of make that process easy um, is helpful. And then thirdly, uh, shipping and fulfillment um, is, is always a consideration. Um, many of your software as a solution, our software as a service options are gonna have some built-in tools here uh, to help with fulfillment, many of those e-commerce platforms. Uh, you want to be a little bit careful that they're not also like adding on uh, fees. Uh, some of them um, may not be giving you the best postage rates. They may be taking those bulk savings that they get as a bigger company and not passing those on to you. Um, so it's just something to be aware of and something and something to watch for. There's a few things, you know, uh, 
Square Stewart and our sister company, Show Pony, started this We Give a Shirt campaign website at the beginning of uh, the COVID-19 um, stuff a couple of you know months ago now. And we are actually using a service called ShipStation to help with our fulfillment. You know, we've got thousands of shirt orders that we're fulfilling. Uh, and this has really been a savior for us. It really takes and makes printing labels and calculating postage and finding the best rates uh, super easy. This is, uh, not a sales pitch for them necessarily, but something like this can really help you out. That is a third piece that's kind of outside of uh, your e-commerce platform. There's another one I heard about just earlier this week called Pirate Ship, which I really like this name, kind of cool little pun, and they have uh, lots of pirate lingo on their website. But they're another offering and kind of a new startup that is uh, that is offering really good rates. They're doing a lot of comparison and trying to help people who are not used to doing fulfillment, not used to, to doing shipping, helping them find the cheapest way to get things mailed out uh, and using the, you know, looking at all the options there. Um, also, don't don't forget about local pickup or curbside pickup or local delivery options. Again, I, I, I've i heard so many small businesses who have had to make changes. And um, I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago, and there's a, an owner of a record store in Seattle, Washington, who like he's had to lay off about half the staff. And so they're really trying to keep things afloat and got people fulfilling orders and taking orders. But he himself as the owner of the business is actually like getting in his car and driving things to people's houses. Uh, and it's just, I think there's an opportunity in some cases to like actually get closer to the customer base and really um, demonstrate a service oriented relationship. You know, it's, it's, a new, it's a new opportunity and maybe something like that doesn't last long term but it is something that maybe you want to make sure that you consider and at least offer I mean, people are asking for um for options here and so if you have the ability uh to do these definitely something to consider other one more thing to consider is can you drop ship um depending on what you sell you may have you may be you may have vendors or suppliers who provide your products who could actually without you having to maintain inventory or buy things in advance or cash flow um purchases, you may be able to sell things that your manufacturers or vendors or wholesalers or distributors could actually ship directly to your customers for you. And you could just be the middleman and, and make make the markup. So those are things to consider. There's a lower inventory risk. Um, it's what a, you see a lot of people doing now. There's lots of options out there online. Uh, and it's something that's definitely worth looking into. You got anything, Daniel, before I go to this next one? No, that's great. I was just, you know, thinking about shipping and fulfillment and and platforms. You know, my 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 background is working in the Very Vera mail order room, shipping five pound frozen or flash frozen, excuse me. Sorry, Vera, if you're watching. Flash <laughs> frozen layer cakes in July to California. And the shipping on these things. I mean, who knows if we were getting the best rate on it, but by the time you bought a, a, a homemade layer cake, you know, with a pound of butter in it, made the old old fashioned way and you get it out to, you know, Redondo Beach, California, you know, you just bought yourself like a $90 cake and it was worth 90 bucks for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, but, you know, a lot has changed uh, since then, uh, but, but ship station, understanding you know how to make sure that you're not getting double markup on you or your business with your vendors and things like that is 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 really critical uh because the level of competition these days uh you know margins can be pretty razor thin so you gotta you gotta watch out for it yep all right this next thing i just want to encourage uh all business owners to really think outside of the box right now i wanted to share just some examples of some things that i have seen people doing in the last couple of months that i thought were smart and just really um considered and how thinking about how they could pivot their existing businesses one of the things that you might want to consider is uh using facebook or instagram live to offer shopping uh there's a little boutique over in north augusta called shop 3130 that some friends of ours um run and i've seen them even this past weekend before mother's day um basically on on facebook live for an hour holding up products talking about these earrings and how they would look good with you know a white outfit and you could wear them to the beach and whatever and people watching that and in the chats saying that i want that you know put put me down send me an invoice for that and people actually so this is a, these are non-traditional ways of selling they don't require an e-commerce platform it's taking advantage of 
like where their customers already were and where they were already engaged with um, their social audience. Um, seeing other people doing that, but I just thought that was really smart and, and, and an opportunity uh, to do a little bit of investment in time and, and to really kind of engage directly with customers. It, it, um, it, dur during the pandemic, it is the perfect time to get over your fear of going live on Instagram or Facebook or, or you know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm a dork if I do that or, you know, this is corny or whatever. Now is the time because it, it the, the, the parameters and challenges of coronavirus have kind of lifted that fear from everybody and and the the way that that comes across to your customer base is you know you're being an entrepreneur you're being creative you're picking yourself up by the bootstraps like you're doing all the things that uh you know that that people will admire about keeping your business running when you know maybe a year ago when you saw somebody on on instagram live or facebook live you're like man that, that person's super vain to do that i could never do that you know but so i encourage you and i'm, I'm one of them i'm kind of hand up uh you know i'm not i wasn't a big zoom guy we like to we like to have clients into the office and you know i haven't we haven't had anybody in here in, in two months uh so we've had to get good at zoom um but now is certainly the time to to get over the fear or anxiety about it absolutely uh Another way is just using social posts in general. Again, all my uh, examples like are, are record stores because that's what I'm into. Uh, but a, a, a company or a little small business that I follow up in Charlotte, North Carolina, for years has been, you know, posting things as people bring them in. You know, use records that they're selling or collections that they're buying. And in the, in the past, they've always shied away from selling online because they had plenty of demand in their physical location. But because they had built an audience already. Um, when everything hit and they had to kind of shut down, they could basically flip that entire model and say, now we're selling all this stuff that we can show you here. If you're interested in it, you say you want to buy it, we'll ship it out to you. And so, to, again, just another way of taking advantage of platforms that exist where audiences and customers already are, then maybe they're not used to shopping there, but that's where they already are spending time. And so meeting them where they're at. Um, I'd also think about how you can leverage the strengths that you've already got to market products in a different way. So I used, I talked about the book tavern a little bit earlier. And one of the things that I saw that they have been doing, you know, you don't go to the book tavern because it's easier than ordering on Amazon. You go because, you know, you want to support lo small local business or you want to hear what David's going to tell you the best book is or what everybody's buying when you walk in or make a recommendation based off of what you're interested in. And so that's the unique offering that they've got. And so to kind of leverage that strength, one of the things that I thought that they were doing in the past couple of months that's been cool is that you can fill out a form on their website now. And for a flat kind of fee, they will send you a bundle of things based off of your interest that they kind of hand select and pick for you. And I just thought that was, again, that's a way of thinking outside of the box, taking advantage of what they're good at, what they can offer uniquely that, frankly, Amazon can't come close. There's no AI in the world that, you know, can lend that kind of personal touch. And so, uh, another example that that I saw in the last couple of weeks, I've got a friend who has a small business. She basically does kind of consulting and kind of one-on-one -on -one help with like organizing in your home. And I think market some online and things by writing blog posts and making suggestions. And she was able to kind of pivot. She can't go to people's homes uh, and took an idea that she had for creating a, uh, a quarantine um, time capsule journal. So it's a, a, a self-published book that is a prompting of like questions and things and kind of ways to document like what life has been like for the past couple of months and it's self-published and it's it's put online and she's taking advantage of kind of some direct to print offering so you can order it and it gets printed by some company you know a couple hours away and shipped directly to you but that's thought that was again another interesting way of thinking about kind of a unique skill set that you've got and a unique offering and being able to pivot that and turn it into a product for a small business um, I would also consider, um, is there a way that you could take something maybe that you have sold in the past or that you're already uh, selling and make it and turn it into a subscription kind of service? There's basically three different kinds of ways this could work. It could be kind of the replenishment model where it's, you know, think about something like Dollar Shave Club where they're sending you new razor blades every month or Blue Apron where they're sending you new food every week or Amazon uh, subscription service where you know, they'll send you a 
case of paper towels, however often you need those. Um, there's a company up in um, up around Greenville, I think, that specializes in HVAC filters. So they'll send you your okay. specific HVAC filter every three months so that you remember how to change it. So is there something that you, you know, some type of I product that you've got that needs replenishing that you could set up on a subscription type of service? The other thing is maybe it's a more of a curation thing. Maybe it's somewhere something like Stitch Fix or Loop Crate or BarkBox, some way that you could curate items to sell. You know, this is similar to what I, the example I gave of Book Tavern, where they're curating a selection of things for people and then selling it. Could you turn that into subscription in this time where it would help with some recurring income and building a relationship with a, a client base? And then maybe maybe that subscription is just for some kind of access. I mean, think about Netflix is really just a subscription that gives you access to a library of content. Um, maybe your library is, you know, access to a specific product set or some kind of knowledge or um you know some kind of consulting um i think daniel you wanted to talk a little bit maybe about the coaching or consulting. Yeah, that, 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 you know that leads into that i mean again this kind of goes back to my point where you know in the age of of covid19 and, and a pandemic uh now's the time to experiment with some things and whether you've been in business for two years or, or 25 years uh you've probably learned a lot of lessons the hard way uh, and can give really good advice to people that are either out of your market, will never be your competition, that do what you do. Um, I mean, there's no telling what I would pay somebody in Texas or Chicago or whatever that had a similar size agency of us. And I said, hey, you know, for an hour, will you just tell me about all your mistakes? I mean, that would be so valuable to me. So consulting, uh, coaching, um, is something that's easy to do. You know, my, my, my brother is a doctor and, and, you know, he had to instantly get into telemedicine. Um, and that's just not for the MDs. Uh, I think doing anything over, you know, a, a, a paid Zoom or video chat or, or something like that, um, there's a market out there for it. It might be a small percentage of your existing customer base now, um, but it's, it's, it's out there. So, uh, whatever it is that you do, uh, consider offering some coaching and, and consulting and, a, a, and if you want to just market, uh, out of market, uh, you can do that or, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty intriguing thing to add on as a service model. It almost reminds me of, uh, Wes, you know, remember my obsession with Cameo a few months ago and how brilliant <laughs> I thought it was? Cameo, for those that don't know, is I think it's brilliant. Uh, you can like celebrities, m mainly like D to B minus celebrities sign up for Cameo and you can pay them like they set their own fee, 25 bucks up to like $500 maybe for somebody. And you can say, hey, it's my wife's birthday. She loved you on your season of The, Bla the Bachelorette. Uh, send her a birthday message. And these, you know, reality stars, pseudo celebrities sit at home on a Sunday and record video messages on their phone and text it to you. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, so Shirley from, there's probably never been a Shirley on The Bachelorette, but Shirley <laughs> saying, hey, Catherine, I heard it's your birthday. I hope you have a great one. You know, sip some, you know, rosé and watch The Bachelorette or whatever. And it's awesome. Uh, I've done it as a goof for all kinds of buddies. Uh, so that kind of ties into, uh, you know, if, if you have it priced correctly and what you have to say has value to someone, why not off offer it? Yeah. All right, some final things that are just, this is the grab bag of, of ideas, but things that I felt like needed to be said and ways to, that maybe we can encourage you. Um, starting small is certainly okay. This is gonna be new territory for a lot of small businesses. Um, the important thing is that you start. So figure out what you can do and what you can get up as soon as possible. What can you start offering? Um, most important thing is that first step. And I think you, you'll be able to react to what is working once you see that. Um, I'd also just remind you that the internet is alive. It's a living thing. It is not. Um, a lot of times we have website clients who get paralyzed by the fact that they don't have all of their uh, 
T's crossed and I's dotted when they're gathering all the content to put on their website. And we always have to remind them, you know, you're not going to have 100,000 brochures that we've printed for you that have got a typo in them. If we find something that's wrong tomorrow, we can fix it in two minutes. And the same thing is going to be true for your e-commerce websites. If you, just, if you find out that something's not selling or not working, you can take those things off, try something new um, immediately. So just be encouraged there. Uh, you're not locked into anything. Watch what's working when you do start trying things and then build on success. I think, um, you know, uh, lots of little examples of this have come up in our We Give Shirt campaign. We've been able to see what's resonated with people. We've been able to see uh, what questions people have had along the way uh, with some of the, the small business t-shirts that we're trying to help people out with. And we've been able to kind of shift and, and make changes to the site and kind of build on success there. And that's been a fun thing to kind of experiment with and, and watch. Um, I would also just personally encourage you from 20 years of experience working on things with websites, um, OOTB out of the box is, I, I would do everything you can with any of these web, uh, web uh, e-commerce platforms that I talked about to use the out of the box functionality first before you go custom. Um, it's so easy to go custom later once you see what you really need. Um, but once you've done something custom, you really are building kind of some technical debt that you're gonna to have to then maintain. So it might make more sense for you as a small business to change your existing business processes to fit something that already is easy to do on any one of these e-commerce platforms, rather than try to bend the e-commerce platform to fit what is maybe your old way of doing things that you might not even remember why you do them the way that you do them. So be open to that. And I think you may find that that openness uh, to change or reveal you know, new, simpler ways of dealing with your customer. Maybe an opportunity there to, to kind of transition um, lots of parts of your business in that regard. And with that, we thank you very much for yeah, giving us this time. We got, got a question over here, Wes. I think I'm yeah. supposed to just jump yeah. in to, to what, what's, yeah. what's going on. Yeah. All right, so, so question number one. What is the bet? What is best with e-commerce websites, a platform or a plugin? You kind of just touched on that there, and, and and I've got a little bit of a philosophy on it that's simple, and probably too overarching, and then you can add to it. Uh, to 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 me, I think question number one is: Does your e-commerce website support your business, or is it your business? Uh, if you don't have a business without this e-commerce site, um, uh, a, a platform, even if it's out of the box, uh, a, a platform is going to, to set you up for a little bit more success other than uh, just kind of adding a, a, a plug in. So that would be question number one that I would ask. What you got, Wes? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree. It's, it's, it's going to depend on, on the business for sure. Um, but the platform, I mean, we use the word platform because it really is a foundational piece. And so the, the selection of what you're going to use there is really going to determine how what you can build on top of that down the road. And so, um, you know, I do give that piece of advice to go out of the box first. Um, but with the with the kind of, you know, addendum to that, you know, you do want to think about what the future might look like um, so that you're not painting yourself into a corner. Um, I think every it's going to be a you know a different answer for everybody. I think the, the real thing is to kind of make sure that you've done a fair evaluation and thinking through like what your needs are. All right, great. Well, I have a few on my end. If you don't have any uh, others that have come through to you, Daniel. Yeah, go for it. Okay. So the first question that we had was, what are the key things that will turn browsers, those I guess who are just looking, into buyers? imagery imagery you know the a lot of times people come to us and they say i need a website and i don't say it like this of course but the real thing is like you need the stuff to put on a website is is what you need you need beautiful photography of your products that make people want it whether it's food you know food photography i mean it's you know it you know taking somebody's money to build a restaurant website and the food photography isn't very good is not the most ethical thing for me to do so a lot of times i'm like ah, i mean we got to start there uh let's get some great food photography so imagery 
um, is is huge. Lifestyle is big, showing the uh, showing it in use. Um, for we give a shirt. Um, you know, we have a couple of different looks at every design. You have the flat T-shirt on a white background, but then you have a mock-up of someone wearing the shirt that's maybe in the demographic of the restaurant or bar or whatever it is. And so people can say, ah, I can kind of see myself, you know, wearing this design. Um, and it helps. It's, it's certainly more work, but you have to, you have to be the guide. You have to be a storyteller. Um, for your customers, for people to ultimately want to put their credit card down and, and buy something. So you really do have to lead them down the path. And imagery is my number one there. Yeah, and I'd just add on to that, like the all of the details around whatever you're selling. The, um, customers have been trained to be self-service at this point with e-commerce. Um, and if you can't find an answer to whether it's the size of something or how much does this weigh or is, is that white or is that off white? Like every any kind of question or detail, or product it, kind of information yeah. that you can provide yeah. is going to be helpful. Yeah. Does this shirt taper as it goes down? It kind of looks like it. You know, stuff like that. You got it. You got to know. Yeah. Which is actually a great lead into the next question, and very appropriate for the space that you operate in with your sister company, Show Pony. So the question is, what about, or what are some, excuse me, outside the box ideas to generate apparel sales? What are some elements of apparel sales that maybe aren't predictive? I'm sorry, predictable or intuitive? Mm -hmm. You know. It's funny. What do we have? Like five weeks of data on yeah. on the t-shirts. Uh, you know, it, it's it, we give a shirt is is not our first e-commerce rodeo, but from a uh, percentage standpoint and from kind of an instantaneous success, uh, we'd be a little hard pressed to find a case study better than this. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with with tapping into uh, to emotion a little bit, where uh, as Wes mentioned earlier, you know, people really do want to support the places that they love. They want to be able to support a bar that you cannot walk into. And other than just Venmoing the owner some money, uh, being able to buy the T-shirt that you can wear uh, creates kind of an emotional a a a attachment. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the buy local part, you know, it is you're supporting, you know, somebody down the street, uh, not the Waltons uh, or, 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 Be or Bezos or whoever. Um, so you're, you're kind of tapping into that. Uh, things that are unique, um, you know, we've honestly sold so many t-shirts, you're probably going to run into somebody wearing the same shirt you're wearing <laughs> down, the, <laughs> down, down the street. But I think most everybody, when they're shopping for a, a, a sports center T-shirt, I'm not sure if they've ever had T-shirts before, but now you can get one. And it's this like badge of honor uh, that it's, this is my dive, right? This is my place where I go get coffee or my favorite restaurant. And so, um, you know, every, nowadays everybody has a personal brand and what you put on yourself and the brands that you represent and rock are kind of the you're telling the story of who you are um and if that's uh letting folks know that you love buona cafe or new moon or whatever your coffee place is uh you know that's a part of it so it's 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 not even it's not even always about how good looking the design is or what color the shirt is it's more of the 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 idea of supporting and, and representing uh, these businesses, I, I think, has worked well for for apparel sales. Great. Well, thank you for that. I think we have time for one more, if we may. Um, this is around security. So, what security risk does e-commerce involve? I can speak a little. I'll let Matt say that one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, going back to the the payment processing uh, stuff that we talked about, and choosing a payment processor. Um, you are not going to directly be handling anybody's credit card information if you use any of these e-commerce platforms that we've talked about today. Um, 
they are going to, you know, you're going to want to have a security certificate installed if you are running a self-hosted option. That would be a requirement for any of those platforms to run. Um, any of the software as a service ones are already going to have that. But the payment processors themselves are the ones who do the interchange of money. Your website itself doesn't facilitate that. It takes your credit card information from where you type it in and enter it on your website. It encrypts that before it ever gets sent across the internet. And that encrypted information is processed by the payment processor. And then, you know, basically a handshake is done back to the store, letting the store know that, the, you know, the payment has gone through or not gone through. Uh, some of the payment processors will even flag suspicious things or, um, you know, help you with, um, with issues like that. Um, but the security risks are really minimal. Um, I know people who aren't used to even online shopping, there's a lot of hesitation for people who have not really transitioned to that and might be skeptical about that or concerned because of breaches or hacks or things like that that have gone on. But really, um, you're at much more risk uh, handing your credit card to, you know, somebody that takes it away from a table at a restaurant and goes and swipes it somewhere that you don't see them writing that down. You got a lot more risk that they're going to, you know, write that card number down than you do in, in actually shopping online. It's actually very, very safe these days because of the pieces and parts that are in place that kind of protect you. Great. Well, wonderful information. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Thanks to Daniel and Wes of Weir Stewart for joining us today. If you have questions following the webinar, uh, we will be providing their contact information with the webinar recording, um, but you can always reach out to Sarah Best, Director of Events, and myself if you'd like us to be a liaison for getting your questions answered. We hope you will plan to join us on Thursday at 3. We will be having a, a representative from the Georgia Chamber of Commerce discuss their recovery and resiliency plan uh, as they look to go back into the workplace and transition phase back in with their businesses. And so we will undoubtedly gain valuable information um, that we as a business community can consider and look to implement as we make plans moving forward as well. So we uh, trust everyone is safe and well, and we thank you again for joining us. We look forward to when we can see you again in person someday really soon. Take care. Thanks, everybody.